socializing I've done in a very long time. <laughs> um, thank you for being here. This is really special. Um, so Brennan is my grandmother's maiden name. Um, my mom always said that uh, I would be a Brennan, either Brennan Michael or Brennan Marie. Um, what my parents did not expect was for me to come out as non-binary, in which case I think they may have named me Brennan Brennan, probably. <laughs> um, I did not realize how vulnerable it would be talking about daydreaming. Um, I have spent much of my life daydreaming and have had a very recent reality check um, that has been quite jarring. Adulting is hard. <laughs> um, life is exhausting and hard. <laughs> Sorry, I did not mean to, I didn't want to get emotional, but I think um, life is just really messy. Mm -hmm. um, I really struggled to sugarcoat things. And I really struggled with how honest to be. Um, existing as a independent creative is very hard. And I do not know how to turn my brain off. I'm always thinking about the next thing. I'm always trying to learn, learn and collect more skills because I love learning. Um, and I always am trying to figure out how to be more resilient <laughs> and find, just figure out the spaces that I can inhabit and create in. Um, Working towards financial stability as an independent creative has been quite the journey. <laughs> um, the lack of affordable spaces to produce creative work here in Grand Rapids has been very frustrating and has led me to take a terrifying financial risk in renting out a commercial studio space, which I'm so grateful to have um, but it is very overwhelming at the same time. Um, I'm so grateful to be living in Creston and to have a studio space in Creston now. Um, I've had a studio space for a couple of months and the work, even though the space is a mess, which eventually I will have a gathering and you can all see it when it feels <laughs> less of a mess. But um, I'm so grateful for the work I've been able to create now having a space and seeing the shift in the work I'm able to produce since having a space is absolutely life-changing. Um, I've been transient for a very long time, and so to, to finally commit to creating a space to produce work I'm excited to, to make is um, it's very exciting, but equally as terrifying. <laughs> um, so along with being a chronic daydreamer. I also happen to be an oversharer. <laughs> um, so I gave myself an outline. Um, I'm 
going to stick to my own. There's, there's so much I want to talk about. I feel like I have so much. Um, I have so many conversations that I'm happy to have one on one about getting divorced while being a wedding vendor. Um, while working for a nonprofit arts organization and how financially it left me no better off than when I started 10 years earlier. Um, these are conversations I'm so passionate about and would love to have one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but today, I'm going to be talking about the following. <laughs> um, so I'll be touching on the survival state, modes of recentering and regulating, my creative output as a means of taking care of myself. Um, and that manifesto was so lovely. <laughs> Excuse me. It, um, it definitely very encouraging, so I really appreciate that manifesto. Um, okay, first, I. <laughs> how many of you? How many of you have uh, taken an art history class? Okay, so most of you. How many of you like postmodernism? Okay, so not very many. This is okay. I feel a little better about this. As, as you were all walking in, I was like, there are a lot of creatives here. I bet a lot of them went to art school. Um, <laughs> so I really want to talk about an uh, art history lesson. Um, but I'm going to. I guess. <laughs> um, so postmodernism informs the work I create, and I have found it to bring me immense joy. So postmodernism uh, is a style or movement which emerged in the late 1950s as a reaction against the austerity, formality, and lack of variety. These are some examples of postmodern work. We have some architecture, we have a lamp, and then this is an example of how interior how we are incorporating postmodernism into interiors right now. Um, if I had to condense postmodernism, I would describe it as structured play. Uh, postmodernism was a direct revolt against modernism. And we're seeing this in the event world in this playful opulence. Um, we, the event world has been stuck in minimalism for <laughs> quite some time, so it's been fun to see um, playful excess. And as you will see my work, is definitely pushing that with the installations I create and um, just what I'm exploring. Out of the bed. A lot of parts. So what I like about about postmodernism is that it doesn't take itself too seriously, and I think. That's something I have learned to do for myself. Um, as an event florist, sometimes the product you order isn't the right color. Sometimes it's not the right shape. Um, sometimes it's not the right scale. And instead of driving all over, wasting time trying to collect the exact perfect thing, um, problem solving and figuring out a new solution and also just taking a breath and t telling myself like it's flowers <laughs> it's fine 
think of this, this gets to be fun and playful. This gets to be, um, like I take, I take my work very seriously, but I also, I've also worked a lot on letting things go um, for my own sanity, <laughs> but also for sustainability reasons. Um, supporting local fl flower farms is really important to me, and using what is available is really important to me. Sometimes I don't even order flowers, and I just go into the wholesale cooler, and I pick out what is available, and I just challenge myself to see what I can create from that instead of taking time to send an email waiting for my wholesaler to respond and like especially if it's a small order like feeling like I'm taking away her time um, so all of that to say is like I'm practicing and learning how to take things in life less seriously because I think it's really important for my own sanity. Um, and it might be for yours as well. <laughs> um, this is some set design and styling work I did for a corporate client a few years ago that was very, very fun to work on. And it, it's been fun to look back at my work and see how postmodernism, even before I was reading about it and learning more about it, um, has informed my past work. Um, by definition, at its heart, postmodernism um, has a general distrust of grand theories, ideologies, as well as problematic relations as well as a problematic relationship with the notion of art. I did not call myself an artist for a very long time. I had this mindset that it was irresponsible to be an artist, that I was a designer, and it's been really nice to come to a place where I'm comfortable allowing myself to be creative and explore and accept the, the label of artist because I know like to my core I am a creative I can't not create and so much of my life is figuring out <laughs> how to create and also survive <laughs> um, how to find balance in that, and um, how to monetize it. I have little, I, I took a, a test recently that broke down my, my qualities and my skills, and I have zero sales. <laughs> like I am nothing about me can, like, sales is just not my thing. <laughs> um, and so it's been interesting to figure out, like, f financially how, how to balance creating and also surviving in, in a consumer state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to go into that too much because that feels like too much, but that is a that is a conversation I would love to have with some of you if that's something you are passionate about. It was comforting finding postmodernism as a design theory because finding finding out other other people or other creatives have been wrestling with the same things you've been wrestling with is very comforting. Um, so I've been enjoying re reading and learning more about postmodernism. modernism 
So as Lex mentioned, I've explored a lot of different creative opportunities. I love creating meticulous, excessively detailed installations. This is another uh, piece of client work. It's hard to see from far away, but uh, we can go back to it later so you can look at it up close. It's <laughs> this one it is um, using bottles that were recycled to, um, I hand painted and I sculpted these bottles into individual flowers and we created this installation for this launch of a product that was using um, recycled plastic. And work like this is my favorite work to do because it is so meticulous. Um, this level of craft for editorial work here in Grand Rapids, I have found is few and far between. Um, but it is my absolute favorite work to do. I love being the art department for sets. This goes back to <laughs> how challenging it is to survive as a creative here in Grand Rapids. Um, I've had to be very scrappy. And it has definitely led to burnout. Um, I saw an advertisement recently for a supplement and it outlined the four the four ways burnout changes your brain and it was very jarring <laughs> um, so I'm going to read those to you <laughs> and you can check for yourself where you're at <laughs> burnout impairs decision making it disrupts your creativity it increases fear and anxiety it decreases memory retention. Existing in this space for too long leads to survival mode, survival mode, which is also known as the fight or flight. I'm not supposed to make this joke, but I'm going to make this joke. Lex has been doing, Lex just finished a master's in mental health counseling. Okay. And <laughs> uh, during the pandemic, uh, during lockdown, I was able to hear some of the like introduction verses, and so I like to make the joke that I I have recently audited a mental a master's in mental health counseling. <laughs> um, so I, it's been really nice to like t learn snippets of how our brains work and how to better take care of them. Um, so in this survival mode, you're in a scarcity mindset. You might forget to take care of yourself and your basic needs, feeling tired, unable to emotionally regulate, experience memory issues, and an, an experience an inability to multitask. So two ways to step out of survival mode is practicing self-compassion and self-regulating. practice self-compassion is, um, well, in general, self-compassion is can be challenging, and I struggle with having compassion for every version of myself, so I like to start with this version, because it is the easiest version to have compassion for. Um, inhibited with 
uninhibited with little to no responsibility. <laughs> um, if you can't tell, I've always been a little bit responsibility adverse. <laughs> I'm the oldest of five kids. <laughs> um, my family is extreme, extremely creative and dreaming has always been encouraged, which led to leaning into my creative tendencies and fostering a critical eye and unique set of skills. Because of my privilege, I made most decisions in my life based on curiosity instead of fear. I've been averse to responsibility, living much of my life in a daydream. From 2012 to 2022, I was transient, which is the start of my survival state. The start of my creative, independent career, learning to adult. <laughs> This hustling survival state is when my day, my daydreaming shifted and I began using my creative work as a form of self-regulating. When I was feeling sad or needed to process, I began taking time for myself to create quiet scenes. These still lives have elements of play, but also carry so much emotional weight. I don't know if I'm too close to the work and just like know everything that was happening during the time that I was just like placing mangoes and flowers in a scene together. <laughs> um, but I, there's a lot of sadness I think, and stillness behind these images. Another way I've explored self-regulating is through flower farming and gardening. I'm often drawn to labor-intensive work, which is how I found myself in the event floral world. If you do not know, event floral work is labor-intensive. You're hauling buckets of flowers, buckets of water, loading and unloading rental trucks in an endless loop. is physically exhausting but at the same time exhilarating. What I love about floral design is I'm creating compostable art that I then can feed my garden with. What I've learned to really enjoy about event floral work is that it is daydreaming with parameters it's a way to give myself structure because I'm limited by materials, by time, by budget. I'm currently really enjoying making playful, petite bouquets for events. <coughs> We've seen giant in the in the event world. We've seen this this shift from minimalism to maximalism, giant garden bouquets that are so heavy. And now I'm exploring ways, and I've made those for 10 years. And now I'm just like, let's just bundle a few berries from the backyard, put a silk ribbon on it. Let's get crazy. Let's just, <laughs> let's just do something a little different. And it's been really fun to see, it's fun to see how it's photographed, but it's also fun to see people get excited about that too, and explore different ways of breaking out of what is normal. Um, this work is from a photo shoot with my sister last fall. Um, I've been working on creating a lot of content to launch 
to relaunch my event offering in a way that feels true and authentic to to myself and, and what I want to be coming out into the world. After eight years as a wedding florist, um, I've relaunched my event and editorial offering under under a new name. So Big City Vibes is a tongue-in-cheek brand identity inspired by the East and West Coast. My design work has moved away from garden style and into a more architectural and postmodern approach. My work, I try to create cheeky, playful work, but there is so much reverence behind what I do. And it's been funny, it's been wild to see that reverence come back again and again. And I'm, I'm excited to show you, so I have work at the end of this that I haven't shared at all. And so I'm excited, I think that will run during the Q&A because there's a lot of it. Um, but it's been excited, exciting to see. <coughs> Sorry. It's been exciting to see the reverence come back in my work again and again. Um, no matter how playful or cheeky I push my work to be, there's always this like deep emotional weight behind it, and. Um, I think you can see it in, in the photos um, I produce. Um, so Big City Vibes is rooted in safe and sustainable workplace practices. When you've been uncomfortable enough in work environments, it's not very hard to come up with your own set of values. Mm -hmm. So, it was really important for me to be very It was important for me to be very clear about where I stood and the workspace I wanted to create for other people who work for me, but also for myself. So I believe in, we believe in tending to the earth, which in large part means we don't use floral foam, which is a microplastic, which is harmful to those who work with it, as well as the earth and the waters it contaminates. We believe in creating safe spaces for work and play. We believe that love is a form of rebellion, that homophobia, racism, bigotry, and body shaming have no place here. When I send out a proposal, I send this with it. So people know who they're hiring, and people know who they're working with. Stating these values helps hold me accountable, but it also helps the right clients find me. When I mention safety within the wedding industry, I don't just mean trimming down the candle wicks. <laughs> Although I'm very passionate about candle safety. <laughs> what I mean when I say safe spaces is seeing, respecting, and celebrating humans and their unions equally. This is not just the case, or this is not always the case, especially in West Michigan. My wake-up call came from a heightened state of safety. It pushed me to set boundaries for myself and the work I create. 
I'm so proud of the work I'm creating today. It's taken a long time to get here, but looking back, each of these days captures a moment of reverie for the couples I create for. I love creating installation work, custom one-of-a-kind pieces that even if I tried to recreate would look different every time. And I'm so grateful to the humans who have invited me to work for them. I talk about this idea with couples when they're struggling with planning, and it addresses the three main pressures when planning a wedding. So the relationship pressure, familial pressure, and societal pressure. When the balance is off, you lose sight of what is most important, which is the relationship. And I tell them to just a little. <laughs> <laughs> My wedding philosophy is if you want to throw a party and hire artists to come play, we'll make your dreams a reality. Because West Michigan is not always a safe space for the LGBTQIA community, especially in the wedding industry, I want to encourage you all to evaluate in your own lives how you can help create safer spaces um, because it's really important. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> um, but I'm excited to keep sharing the rest of the work I've been creating um, during the Q&A.